Hello everybody, I am Conquering History Games and welcome to the last of the uh, Culture Krieg progress reports that are out up to now. Uh, this looks to be an absolute monster of, a, of a, um, a report, so we're going out with a bang here with a country that I'm sure a lot of you are really interested in. This is progress report number 13, the Pacific States of America, part one. Read, uh, 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 written by Desu, a.k.a. John Dark Hunter, a.k.a. the CEO of Lockheed and Boeing, the Pacific States of America, Deb. Deb. He's going to be our guide to the land of glitz, glamour, and American democracy, such as it is, out west and noir by the music that I've put on. This progress report will primarily act as an introduction to the Pacific States and the myriad issues, factions, and people that compromise it as well or comprise it excuse me as well as a look into some of the first content the pacific has to experience let's get started with how we got here shall we and by the way this is the proper most up-to-date map uh i think uh in the american union state one i uh i showed a, an incorrect map that still had the combined syndicates of america on it so apologies for that let's jump into the lore as per previous development diaries, this lore is not a complete picture of what occurred and further details will be in-game. However, this should be a decent frame of reference for the rest of the development diary, so that the war years and immediate past of the Pacific States is clear. Following Douglas MacArthur's seizure of Washington, D.C., the governors of California, Oregon, and Washington met with members of Congress who refused to side with General MacArthur. They demanded the restoration of congressional power, and announced that elections were going to be held for an emergency president in defiance of his orders. Three candidates expressed a desire to run for this office. California Senator Hiram Johnson, Republican, California Governor Frank Miriam, uh, Republican, and Oregon Governor Charles H. Martin, Democrat. Frank Miriam was presumed to be the front runner before improper handling of the simultaneous Bay Area strikes and the San Diego crisis led Republican politicians to defect to Johnson's candidacy. Johnson then announced the formation of the Progressive Party, drawing large numbers of both Progressive Republicans and Democratic candidates due to the unique political circumstances of the West Coast, and achieved a majority vote in the 1937 emergency elections. MacArthur announced a deadline for the disbandment of this rebel government. Newly elected President Johnson refused and formed a war cabinet, with officials from the United States government defecting to this new government. MacArthur ordered military officials in the West to arrest these officials and end the insurrection, an order which was disobeyed by multiple officers focused around General George Marshall, who promptly announced his support for this new government. Between 1937 and 1940, Nevada, most of Arizona, most of Idaho, and parts of Utah were seized by the new Western Defense Command of the Pacific Army. However, these offensives stalled between 1938 and 39 due to insurgencies in Portland and Seattle, which were only ended after negotiations in 1942 with Socialist Party politicians in the Seattle Accords. In 1940, elections were held once again, with voting being held in California, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Arizona, and Idaho, though limited in the latter two due to ongoing pacification campaigns. Between 1940 and 1942, the Pacific Army seized most of Montana, Wyoming, about half of New Mexico, and amidst a hard-fought series of battles managed to take Utah and parts of Colorado. In 1942, sections of the Federalist Army, led by Omar Bradley and Dwight D. Eisenhower, signed a separate peace with the Pacific States and offered their services to the Western Defense Command in exchange for amnesty. The territory under those officers ended up under the control of the Pacific States. They reached their high water mark with the seizure of the city of El Paso, Texas in mid-1942. Hey, the Sun City! <laughs> Following these actions, the Pacific States and American Union State competed for formerly Federalist territory, with the American Union State managing to push the Pacific States back behind the Rio Grande and Rocky Mountains with the sole exception of Albuquerque, New Mexico. The Cheyenne ceasefire was signed between the two powers in 1943 following the fall of Denver and Cheyenne. After the war, Hiram Johnson announced his desire to not run for another term in 1944, and his former attorney, General Earl Warren, was selected to be the progressive candidate for the 1944 Pacific States election. 
Now, with the states of Arizona and Idaho formally reintegrated back with full civilian government, Warren managed to achieve a strong electoral victory and continue progressive rule of the Pacific states. In Warren's first three years, he oversaw national recovery, redeveloped infrastructure, and integrated the remaining states into the Union, with the final civilian government of Wyoming being sworn in in November 1946. Okay, start the PowerPoint slide. The Pacific States Starting Situation and Politics The political scene of the Pacific States of America in 1948 is primarily dominated by two major parties, the ruling Progressive Party, newly formed in 1937, and the Republican Party. The Progressive Party is led by Earl Warren, Earl Warren, the sitting president of the Pacific States. They advocate the continuation of welfareist policies, the expansion of social benefits in the wake of war, government-led reconstruction programs, and a pro-accordist foreign policy, though with internal divide over the details, particularly on the left wing of the party. Meanwhile, the perennial Republican Party forms the second of the two major parties, having managed to survive the post-Second American Civil War mostly intact. They are currently undergoing a leadership shift following their failure to contest the 1944 elections effectively, though it appears likely the unexpected candidate Howard Hughes will succeed in securing the nomination for the 1948 election. They advocate market-oriented policies, a reduction in social welfare programs, increased societal reform, and a softly pro accordist foreign policy, though internal factions are divided as to the extent of any of these policies. One of the two major parties, the Democratic Party, has seen major backsliding since the failures of their one-time president, John Nance Garner, to keep their party and the country together. Progressive Democrats, already strong on the West Coast, defected to the rising Progressive Party, while moderates either joined them, joined the Republicans, or only remained tepidly within the Democratic Party. Though they start in a weak state, they hope that they can attempt to regain some of their own power with the upcoming 1948 election and a strategic alliance with the Republicans. As a result of this planned alliance, they are expected to not nominate their own candidate, but support Howard Hughes should he win the Republican nomination, though it remains to be seen if this will hold or if they will break for their own candidate once more after this election. Ideologically, they advocate agrarian populism, broad-based social conservatism, welfareist policies insofar as they aid the first two goals, and soft isolationism, distrusting the accord. An oddity in Pacific state politics, the Socialist Party of America in the Pacific is a shell of its former self. Indeed, their continued existence is only due to a tenuous agreement with the national government, allowing them to continue to exist in exchange for an end to hostilities and a purging of revolutionary elements from their ranks. Being one of the few major Socialist Party politicians to agree to this request after being purged by the Fosterite camp, Upton Sinclair continues to lead the party as a figurehead, though it is unsure how long this will last. While there remain some old Socialists in the party dissatisfied with the uh, situation, most of the rank and file realize there is little they could do about their current situation, and thus have resolved to keep their heads down. There are three other organizations of Pacific State politics. The Young America League, the America First Party in the Pacific, and the American Vanguard Party. However, each of these either do not have active political wings, in the case of the first, or are legal, in the case of the latter two, and thus are not able to be elected. Each of these parties is represented both in the congressional mechanic to be discussed later in this progress report, as well as the state mechanic, which denotes the state's governor, the state ruling party, uh, yes, yeah, so governor, party, the number of electoral votes the state possesses, any factors or unique circumstances that state level politics has, the region the state is in, senatorial and house seats, the overall popularity of each electable party in the state, and the overall popularity of each electable party in the state. Each of these is intended for easy reference and can be displayed upon clicking on a state, similarly to the other American successor countries. The final year of Warren in the 1948 elections. When Gameplay begins in 1948, there is still a year of Warren's term in office to go. 
This last section of the term comes with its own mini-tree, including finalizing national economic recovery programs, expanding infrastructure to the newly reintegrated states, and finishing public works projects. This year, we'll also see the ending of a long process to move the capital of the Pacific states from Sacramento to San Francisco, which will include a number of choices for the government to make that will have further impacts down the line. However, the biggest issue of note will be the upcoming elections in November, which will include challenges for the Office of the President, Congressional Offices, and Gubernatorial Offices. Campaigning for these offices will not commence until both major parties have selected their presidential candidates, at which point the player will decide which party they will support in the campaigning process. Once this has been selected, they will gain access to the election decision category, which will be displayed in some form every time offices are up for contestation, whether in a presidential midterm or off-year election. Each office that is up for grabs can be displayed, though congressional and gubernatorial elections are hidden by default during presidential years, as well as the predicted winners to allow for players to prioritize contested elections in their campaigning. Both parties will receive the ability to campaign in each of the various states in the Pacific states one at a time, making strategic campaigning a necessity. There will also be a series of events over the course of every campaign season, which will impact the popularity of the various parties, particularly as the date of the election rapidly approaches. Once election day comes and the winner of each in each election is decided, a new phase of American politics will begin. If Earl Warren manages to gain a second term, he will continue the welfareist reforms of his first term while attempting to move the Pacific states into a better position to take on the future through economic subsidization and cooperating with accordist partners. He will also attempt to begin reforms in the direction of alleviating growing civil rights concerns. Meanwhile, if Howard Hughes manages to achieve an upset and dethrone the Progressive Party's grip on Pacific state politics, he will prioritize removing what he sees as blocks to the success of the Pacific economy and business while working towards securing foreign lines of trade, building up the Pacific's economic links around the world. He will also attempt to go after enemies within the Pacific society, though it remains to be seen if he will be successful, particularly as concerns about his health mount. This is the full Warren 1948 to 1952 tree. This is the full Howard Hughes 1948 to 1952 tree. <clears throat> Congress and negotiations. However, as much as the people of these new and these newly elected presidents may want their agendas completed, there still remains the slight issue of the legislature that actually has to put these concepts into law. The Congress of the Pacific States. Both the Warren and Hughes trees will have a number of foci, which when completed will allow for prospective bills to be placed on the dockets of the Pacific States Congress for debate and passage. For gameplay purposes, legislation is presumed to start in the House of Representatives unless absolutely required to start in the Senate, at which point the amount of legislatures in support of the bill will be calculated based on a variety of factors. If the requisite amount of legislatures are in support of the bill, passage will be fairly simple. However, if the bill doesn't have enough legislatures, lobbying efforts will be required. Depending on the level of potential support and various parties for the bill at hand, a range of legislatures can be won over with lobbying efforts who will require various kickbacks and concessions represented through the abstraction of political power and an overall gain in the popularity of that party. Whether through lobbying or the merits of the bill, once it is passed, the effects will be implemented over time. Armed Forces and Foreign Policy in addition to political trees, two more categories will be unlocked following the 1948 election, the Armed Forces Tree and the Foreign Policy Tree. The Armed Forces Tree will begin with the implementation of the National Security Act in 1947, passed the previous year, which will officially form the United States Pacific Air Force and place the Department of War, now Army, and Department of the Navy under the Department of Defense. Following the Second American Civil War, the Army of the Pacific States is large, well-equipped, and seasoned, but it is struggling to find its present footing in the post-war period. Officers within its structure debate regularly whether or not the Army should be focused on the defense of the Pacific states or a hypothetical renewed offensive into the American Union state, while others argue over the level of heritage that should be taken from the reintegrated Federalist forces uh, versus homegrown Pacific developments. In order to settle the deadlock, one side or the other in both of these debates will need to be taken. 
Regardless of the conclusion of this debate, though, the Army needs to establish procurement lines for modernized equipment and academies to train new officers. Finally, once all of the plans are drafted and modernizing is underway, more may be required of the Army. This, oh goodness, is the uh, <laughs> full Army tree. Hold on. There we go. That's weird. Okay. Meanwhile... The Navy of the Pacific is large, even in just its San Diego squadrons, owing most of its strength to the former United States Navy Pacific Fleet almost wholly siding with the Pacific States within the first year of the war. But it has a number of outdated ships as its core, suffers from a lack of dockyards, and languished from being a low priority during the wartime years. It will thus need to expand its facilities, train new officers, draw up designs for new warships in order to maintain its relevance over the next years, which will inevitably, but inevitably require it to decide whether to focus on projecting power over the oceans or focus on a more coastal defense and convoy protection. In addition, if the Pacific States manages to retake uh, lost territory in the Pacific, the Navy will be the first in the line of defense and will require expansion of its facilities to accommodate these gains. This is the full Navy tree. Lastly, the Air Force of the Pacific States is its newest and most modern branch, with its predecessor in the Pacific Army Air Force having performed valiantly over the skies of the Rocky Mountains. Its greatest strength is the aviation industry on the West Coast, with companies like Boeing, Lockheed, Northup, and others maintaining their production lines and continuing to develop new aircraft for the Pacific States. However, even as it... Uh, develops newer and cutting-edge aircraft, it risks falling behind due to its relatively small size, and thus will need to invest heavily into research and development to keep its edge. In addition, the internal groupings of the Fighter Mafia and the Bomber Mafia have made their priorities for development clear, and this debate will have to be settled in order to effectively prioritize research. This is the full Air Force tree. The Pacific Marine Corps will also have a small amount of content in order to solidify its role in the new Pacific military, as many of its former duties in foreign interventions and amphibious warfare are no longer applicable to the current state of the Pacific Armed Forces. This is the full Marine Corps tree. This is the full Armed Forces tree. A uh, key issue of the Pacific States in the post-war is its foreign policy particularly attempting to secure recognition from non-accordist powers in an attempt to gain diplomatic leverage as the true successor of the United States government in the face of Union state diplomacy. This tree will unlock following the 1948 election, but unlike the other sections of the 1948 to 1952 tree, it will remain open permanently, allowing these diplomatic initiatives to be conducted under other presidents even as they have their own diplomatic maneuvers and crises to navigate. Of particular note in this tree is the establishment of foreign offices in hostile countries which could be used in order to attempt to exert influence and claw territory away from those powers. They can also conduct further diplomatic actions with friendly nations after offices are established, such as trading equipment with a victorious Guangzhou government, or arranging for the returning of refugees from Mexico. Lastly, they will be strongly involved with the game for Hawaii, which will be expanded upon in another progress report down the line. Some segments will have to be locked behind the selected 1948 president, similarly to other president-exclusive foreign policy decisions to come. This is the full uh, foreign policy tree. Note Earl Warren and Howard Hughes sections. And this is the full focus tree so far. Um, note. Teasers for part two and conclusion. As much as I would like to show you everything we have planned, this wasn't quite possible in just one progress report. So another one will be coming down the line detailing the rest of the content that we have to offer for the Pacific States of America. Included in this will be future political developments, territorial exchanges, and the next round of presidential elections. And more. So stay tuned. And, you know, special thanks to everybody in the America team, particularly Nina Kennedy and Lee for the rest of the team that make this possible. Woo! That was a long one. I don't think that was the longest report, actually, just in terms of word count, but there is so, so, so many pictures. But, uh, yeah, lot of a, a whole lot of democracy going on here in the PSA. All these parties are going to have to juggle about. But these unique state modifiers 
I think are going to be really interesting in terms of flavor. So this is the Utah one they had as that example, where you have the uh, the Mormon uh, the Mormon Church here. So like one of the things it says here is, while the church remains politically neutral, its members have often taken strict stances on various topics ranging from social welfare to the civil rights movement, resulting in an unusual political situation where all parties ranging from the furthest left socialists and furthest right Democrats alike attempt to court the church's good graces. Utah will be generally supportive of general welfare and societal aid reform policies, while opposing policies which are seen as harming the moral character of the church or society so that's not even all of it but that's uh that's really really interesting to me and you have the uh yeah the rocky mountain state and stuff a uh, lot so much detail going on in here i'm um, really 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 looking forward to part two and uh thank you everybody who has been along with me on this journey of getting through all the cult craig progress reports uh, of course whenever there is a new one please somebody let me know immediately uh and um i'll you know, do that one too uh with that it's gonna be time to work on uh going over some other progress reports for different mods that are in my backlog uh but uh, i just want to say that if you've been watching all these progress reports and you enjoyed the content um, if you want to help support the channel, YouTube membership uh, button is right down there. Uh, every Sunday I stream for at least four hours exclusively for members and I leave those videos up. So if you're not able to watch those on Sunday, you can check them out during the week. Um, without any further ado, I'm Conquering History Games. And oh yeah, and by the way, this is going to be, this is very interesting to me. Like yeah, this Vietnamese, uh, Filipino stuff. Uh, yeah, working with rebels or dissidents or, or whatever. That, uh, that seems like it could get very interesting as well. But um, yeah, I'm Conquering History Games, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.